This is a Media Lab podcast. Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show, and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. I am super excited to jump into this week's episode all about pretty women. As me and my guest Stephanie Lim kind of uncover throughout this episode, think that there is absolutely more to this song than meets the eye, at least on first listen. The other thing I wanted to mention, as I was editing this episode together, there was a little bit of a brain wave that came over me, and I am 100% open to being called ridiculous, completely 100% wrong, but I would love to hear your thoughts, like a, like a thousand percent, please write in to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com, or hit me up on any of my social media accounts, uh, and it's, I think, partly inspired because over on the Patreon for for certain tiers, I have been going through Stephen Sondheim's 40 favorite films of all time. He made this list back in the early 2000s, and I've been going through each of those films and talking about it a little bit more in depth. Regardless, because of that, and kind of uncovering a little bit of how much of a cinephile he actually was, and also knowing that Citizen Kane was one of his favorite films of all time, the judge states in this song, it's not one of the sung lines, but he calls Joanna pretty as a rosebud. I mean, further on to the song, he also talks about how he wants to, like, see her flower picking, which I also think is an allusion to, to maidenhood and stuff like that. But very quickly, if you don't know, in the movie Citizen Kane, and spoiler alert for an 80-year-old movie... The last words of Charles Foster Kane are Rosebud, and you discover at the end it's this his sled that he had as a kid. It was also, by Orson Welles, the star and director of the movie, a dig at William Randolph Hearst, who didn't like Orson Welles all that much, and who Charles Foster Kane is based off of, because Orson Welles knew that William Randolph Hearst called his girlfriend, Marion Davies, her, you know, genitalia, he called that her Rosebud. So not anyone, like no one would actually have known that going and seeing the film unless you were deep behind the scenes of Hollywood. Of course, that has now come out and everyone now knows that little fact. And I'm wondering if perhaps this is a reference that the judge is making that's in there as a reference to just make the judge even far more creepier. Like I said, this hit my brain as I was editing the episode. I am a thousand percent open to being called completely wrong. I know it's not technically part of the lyrics, so I don't know if that was part of the Christopher Baum play beforehand or not. Anyways, would love to hear what people's thoughts are on that. All right, I do want to read one bit of correspondence here before we do get into the episode. This was sent in by Noah, and he wanted to talk a little bit about ladies and their sensitivities from last week. And he writes in part, My read of ladies and their sensitivities has always been that the Beatle knows exactly why Joanna is not interested in the judge's advances. I should have maybe set this up here a little bit better. Uh, in my discussion with Matt Steele last week, how much of this does the Beatle actually believe? So how shrewd as the Beatle actually being. Anyways, Noah continues. The Beatle is around them all the time. He's seen how they interact, but the judge is also his benefactor. The Beatle can't just tell him that lecherous old guardians aren't usually attractive to their young female wards. So the Beatle is in a bit of a bind. He has to come up with a reason he can give the judge to explain why the judge hasn't been able to attract Joanna. And the reason has to be plausible to the judge, yet not give him serious offense. Knowing that the judge is a lustful man, focused on appearances, the Beatle focuses on the judge's own appearance as the rationale he'll sell to the judge. He knows the rationale may be enough to work. The judge is not exactly knowledgeable in the art of wooing women, other than by forcing himself on them as he did Lucy. Notice that after the Beatle's initial verse, the judge suggests to the Beatle, Maybe if she greets me cordially upon my return, I will give her a small gift eye-rolling stuff. And it's that line that causes the Beatle to launch into ladies and their sensitivities for the first time. It's a subtle warning to the judge that his way of handling women is not likely to work. It also probably doesn't hurt that by suggesting personal appearances as the problem, the Beatle knows he can also provide the judge a ready-made solution, since he's just witnessed Sweeney's skill in the contest. Similarly, I think the Beatle uses lecherous imagery to discuss the matter, at least in part, because the judge himself is lecherous. 
Whether or not the Beatle thinks this way himself, and perhaps he does, having helped to ravish Lucy and poor thing, he also knows that the judge will more readily agree with the Beatle's theory if couched in lustful terms. Anyways, I thought that was a really well thought of and well written kind of response to exactly the motivations of the Beatle from last week. So thank you, Noah. But it is now time to talk a little bit more in depth about pretty women. So here is my conversation with Stephanie Lim. And what may I do for you, sir? A stylish trimming of the hair, a soothing skin massage. You see, sir, a man infatuate with love, her ardent and eager slave. So fetch the pomade and pop. Stephanie Lim, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thank you so much for having me and for letting me indulge in this Sondheim love and fandom. <laughs> of course. I mean, I think where we need to start, I like to do this every time we have a new guest on the show. You have a pretty wide, I think, knowledge by the sounds of it of theater or a love of theater in general where did that come from what, what started your journey into loving theater i would say well i was in performing arts in high school i did everything band choir drama mm. um, so i was doing musical theater back then but i don't think i really got into theater uh, geekdom if you will until i was early on in college i would probably say uh, wicked la had to sit down for almost right. two years, I think. Um, and because it was there, I got to see that many times. And essentially my first uh, major professional production to to see. And it was just, I don't know, Wicked is so <laughs> lovely. It has a first show. Uh, it's, it's like that expensive, like pomp and circumstance of a show, right? It's like, oh my gosh, yes. we can do this on stage. I think we were in the back row of of the mezzanine, but uh, seeing Defying Gravity <laughs> and not right. expecting it even. Um, I think that was a very magical um, experience <laughs> that I still remember. Anyway, so that launched me into theater and getting to see a, a bunch of other shows since then. And um, now teaching theater, mm -hmm. and and I was I actually don't think I was um, a declared major yet. So right after that, I became an English major, um, but I transitioned. Um, between my MA and my PhD into theater. So now I've devoted my life to the theater. <laughs> oh, that's great. I mean, just in your role as, as teacher then in this case, does that change your relationship with theater as you're like introducing some of these things to students at all? Do you feel that it gives you a deeper appreciation for it? Or is it like, oh, I have to mark 30 papers on this thing? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was different. That was different than how I thought you were going to pose yeah. the question. I honestly always approach my classes by saying up front that I am a theater geek. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I'm coming from. Um, I think it's easy for a lot of academics to get lost in academia and scholarship, but that is not how I came into my love for theater. And so I sort of start there transparently. And so I think because of that, and also because of my English background, I tend to stay away from like the traditional sort of essay um, mm -hmm. papers. And I try to get students to think much more creatively or much more dramaturgically about even things like musical theater and, and Sondheim um, yeah. when I can. Are you mostly focused on like the analyzation of or the analyzing of specific pieces or are you doing like the history of theater both maybe like where does your your fascinations lie? I specifically in my own work, I think I think more about adaptations and analyzing mm. sort of dramaturgical movement from one uh, original, quote unquote, original text to maybe a more modern or different direction um, of the text um, in classes or when I'm teaching, I tend to teach just the general sort of theater history, musical theater history classes. Mm. Um, in those cases, I I'm trying to juggle a lot of things at once. Right. So yes, history and trying to get students to think very critically about specific uh, musical numbers, if we can, or think very specifically about scripts. And yeah, because of my work as, as a dramaturg as well, I, I try to steer students in that direction as well to think holistically about work. Well, this is a great series for you to be a part of here then, because one, this is an adaptation of an adaptation, actually. Ah, <laughs> it's, yes, it's kind of like yes. two ways to, that you can look at the musical Sweeney Todd, of course. But it also is a bit of um, a watershed moment in Broadway history, right? There, there, It was doing a big swing at the time of like, can we combine a horror film and put that on stage and musicalize it at the same time? And will people be willing to go along for the ride? So I don't know if you have any insight onto either of those things. You know, I have very little contact with the 
history of the original sure. play only in that I, I teach it as a contextual point um, mm -hmm. in class. But just reviewing all of the ways that the song has been conceived in, the, mm -hmm. in films or in stage versions and um, adaptations of musical adaptations of the adaptation, I suppose. Yeah. Um, yeah, those are the things that are exciting to me. Just thinking about the different ways that performers and directors and designers can take on um, the story and this mm -hmm. uh, music and think about uh, the characters in different ways or think about the stories in different ways. What was your first introduction to Stephen Sondheim? My memory fails me these days, but <laughs> I am remembering in high school choir class, and I don't remember why we were we would have had this, but it was mm -hmm. like a rainy day type of feeling. And I remember watching Into the Woods. It would have been the VHS at the time. Yeah, I remember sitting in class and, and watching Into the Woods on a little TV screen hung up on the wall and um, just the way that the enthralled. authors intended it to be watched the first time, yes. <laughs> yes. I just remember being fascinated by yeah. uh, these fairy tale characters that we all know and love come to life. And um, I think also that because that was my first sort of exposure to Sondheim, um, I think I was also enthralled by the denial of the traditional happy ending. That mm -hmm. was exciting to me as well. Um yeah. And then I remember my mom and I got the, we eventually got the DVD, we got the cast recording. And so we were watching and listening yeah, yeah. to it um, a lot, but yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. Uh, I love that filmed uh, production of Into the Woods. I think they do a good job yes. of capturing it. I, <laughs> I've told this story a few different times, but my first introduction to Into the Woods was an actual live version of it uh, oh, okay. in a city that's close by. And I also was not super familiar with Stephen Sondheim at the time as a teenager. And so I just remember the end of act one going, you know, the curtain closing. I'm like, well, that was a fun show. And then yes, not realizing yeah. there was a second part to it. And it's like, oh, there's another part. What did they do? They wrapped up everything. <laughs> how, how do you go from there? And it's like, oh, it gets very depressing very quickly. That's what happens. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. The denial of expectation as well. Well, and I think that's what was so fascinating to me. I mean, nowadays it's so... Uh, so many people have done like the alternate fairy tale or like skewering of the norms and stuff like that. But that really, for me, was the first time really encountering that. I'm like, oh, yeah, what what does happily ever after actually mean in this context? Mm -hmm. so, now, how about Sweeney Todd specifically? Do you remember the first time you came across Sweeney Todd? I was thinking about this the other day and I cannot remember uh, <laughs> when I first encountered Sweeney Todd. It's very possible that I first saw the Tim Burton mm -hmm. film because that was right around the time I was really getting into theater. And since then, I think I've only seen, again, my memory fails me. I think I've only seen two live productions, uh, one in Costa Mesa. And then I saw the um, New York Barrow Street version. Oh, and the pie um, shop. Probably three or four times. That's cool. I've, I've heard so many great things about that pie shop version that I <laughs> really wish I could have actually seen it myself. Alas, I did not. Uh, general feelings about the show itself. Like, is this one of your favorite musical productions or is it just something that you find interesting? Or I don't know. How do you approach Sweeney Todd? I think I would call this probably one of my favorite Sondheim shows. Um, I think I'm also you know, very attracted to this because I use it in class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was excited to get the invite from you to to do right. this um, particular episode. But yeah, I, I tend to use this in class as a way of introducing students um, to just musical theater in general, because it does lie, you know, within that sort of in-between state of yeah. the bounds of musical theater and, and what can escape outside of those bounds. And then I think students come into the class because I generally teach either non-majors or major specific classes, but students tend to come into the class having expectations or assumptions about what musical theater is. And so Sweeney Todd is a great text to think very critically about how music can function on stage and how music can be more revealing of the dynamics and relationships between characters and the story and all of that. Well, I guess, yeah, just to dig into that just a little bit. And I don't know if you, any of your students are listening, I guess they can use this to cheat. But um, what what are your own opinions on that? Like, how does this show use characters and themes to kind of push musical theater forward? I think sort of um, what we were talking about with Into the Woods, right? It's mm -hmm. because it's so groundbreaking in the sense that it's bringing in this new genre on stage. Um, I think that is is very much pushing against the expectations of musical theater as entertainment for entertainment's sake or like that it, that musical theater is fun. I mean, it, Sweeney Todd is very fun, but at yeah, the same yeah. time, it can also be very dark and very serious. And that is very much in line with Sondheim and the concept 
um, mm-hmm. musical genre. And I, I always pose the question to students of, you know, what what if this were your first musical that you right, were ever yeah. exposed to rather than, I don't know, something like Oklahoma or, or Wicked yeah, yeah. even. Um, and how would this show shape the way you understand musical theater? That's uh, that's actually a really fascinating question to, to unpack. I mean, I feel like, of course, I am so biased because I was so into musical theater growing up as a teenager and everything like that. So I was just collecting albums and listening to things you got from the golden age all, up, all the way up to like mm-hmm. present day of the 90s. Is the, Are there people coming into your class that really have no idea what Sweeney Todd is? I think so. Yes. I I feel Mm -hmm. like I tend to encounter classes in which students have minimal. I mean, there are the definite like musical theater fans, but generally speaking, a lot of the class makeups that I get are students who don't really have um, any sort of historical or even personal experience with musical theater beyond maybe seeing a show in high school or it's also shifted a lot right because i hate to bring hamilton up but hamilton <laughs> being such a popular yeah. uh, recording and and the music being played on mainstream uh radio mm-hmm. has changed the way people encounter musical theater um and so i think students i get generally sophomores juniors maybe this generation is much more exposed to musical theater outside of seeing a stage uh, a live stage yeah. production there's they're hearing more of the music i think well what what i've been coming across and like this is now going to transfer into me sounding like the oldest man in the world i was talking to someone else the other day there's that song k Sarah Sarah, which most mm. people don't realize originated from a hitchcock film like that's the first time that song came up but then became a standard and people started to sing it outside of that context mm. and now people can know the song without ever having seen the movie and i feel that like musical theater is having that kind of same thing a little bit with hamilton but especially on tiktok because tiktok mm. often just takes songs and samples them throws them into a song it's like oh it's the tiktok song i love that song it's like yeah but it's also part of this show that is commenting oh. this and that kind of thing so it's like this like two or three levels of like separation from what the original media mm-hmm. was to how you're actually experiencing it the first time i'm now totally blanking there was a show not just hamilton that that's how the majority of people knew the songs from was tiktok sampling it so many oh. times that they hadn't actually seen the show <laughs> and that's how it became popular in the first place so anyways this is me talking like i know what i'm talking about but i don't really <laughs> i just know that that's happening and it's in the ether i can't remember the show we were talking about maybe it was a gypsy but um one of the shows a lot of students were commenting that oh i didn't realize that the, that this song came from mm. the show um and that's how it actually originated Uh, my friend his wife uh they were watching the new west side story and she had never seen the original production uh, had never seen a production of west side story and when the song i feel pretty started she's like is this from this musical originally i'm like Oh, yes, <laughs> it, wow. it is. So I th- always think that that's interesting that people can know songs and like, oh, this yeah. is you didn't know that this is actually originated from over here, um, which I'm sure will happen to like other Sondheim songs, especially like oh, Sending yeah. the Clowns or something like that. Or right. uh, Don't yeah. Rain on My Parade or, or not, don't, not that's not a Sondheim song, but those types of songs <laughs> where it's like, oh, I know that. Or this is also dating myself because this probably hasn't been relevant for like a decade now but the glee covers of certain songs i found were like (laughs) i love this song the glee version of it but had no history with like the original song and in the context it was being sung anyways that's all to say that we are here to talk about the song pretty women from sweeney todd you know i before we jump into this song in particular this is i didn't actually prepare you for this but from Uh your memory did you know like what is happening in the show at this point? Like right before this song happens at the shop, Sweeney and Lovett are trying to figure out what to do with Pirelli's body. Yes. The judge has arrived. He's just killed this fake Italian guy. The trap is set. He's going to kill him. He's going to fulfill his revenge fantasy now here at this point. And then he sings a song for four minutes. And I do find this interesting is that Sondheim writes very extensively about the fact that he has Sweeney singing for four minutes before he even tries to kill the judge. Narratively speaking, coming from someone who like talks about this stuff, analyzes this type of stuff, why would we have a character sing rather than just like go in for the kill right away. So I think there's two ways I can answer this. Mm -hmm. The first way, like technically speaking, right. We're only an hour into the show. Mm -hmm, And so mm -hmm. there needs to be 
some sort of waiting uh, yes. that occurs uh, because otherwise there's no more show. <laughs> the murder has happened right. and that's it. I think the other sort of more thematically speaking, this song is very much about the like thrill of anticipation or ex expectation. Sweeney sings the line revenge can't be taken in haste. And so I think he's very much recalling what Mrs. Lovett has has tried mm -hmm. Um, so down influencing you know, yeah. Into him. yes yeah it's this whole idea that the like the thrill of the chase is much more fun and exciting and um it, it can enhance the act itself even more than just rushing into the act itself i also think in the previous mrs lovett song she's talking a lot also about really enjoying the moment enjoying the current moment as it is and yes. not harping too much on the past or on the future and so i think this is Sweeney's taking on that advice um, and really just embracing the mm -hmm. moment as it is like it's finally yeah. here. Reveling he finally in has him in his moment, chair. Yeah. Yes, he, he's soaking in the the feeling of he's finally here right in front of me. Yeah, well, I think and not to jump way too far ahead, but I mean, what I always love about this is that, of course, we have this entire song and it will eventually get reprised. Its echo is heard in that final sequence that happens where the judge comes back into the barber shop and he basically does this reprise of pretty women, but like rushes through it. <laughs> so he doesn't slow down and that, cause it's like, I just need to kill this judge, right? I just need to do it. It's like pretty women are wonder slits the throat. And this one, it makes that moment feel so much better because we are taking our time in this song. So I think it does work well with what eventually happens in the show here too. As far as this meeting goes though, between Sweeney and the judge, this is the first time they are actually meeting face to face since uh, Sweeney came back here to London. Is there anything that you think that it plays with our expectations with at all of like an audience? I'm not sure where, if this is where you were going with the question, mm -hmm. but something I bring up often with students is um, what we expect out of like duets. And I wouldn't necessarily call this a love song, but yeah, just what, duets constitute or connote um, for audiences. And so I think this song plays with that expectation, first of all, because it is male, male duet, and not right. a male, female or heter heterosexual duet. And so this is pushing against that heterosexual romance. It, it is much more of a homosocial bonding sort of song. Yeah, I can only speak for myself. And I, I this is really what I was thinking of over like the last couple of weeks, just out of the context of the show. Let's say that I had never listened to the music and you're coming to me and saying, so the judge and Sweeney are now meeting up for the first time and we need to write a song for this moment. Instinctively, honestly, I think I would write something that's far more aggressive than what this song actually is, where it's like Sweeney wants to you know, go in for the kill and the judge might be unsuspecting to that at this point. But he's also now trying to like marry his ward, which has its own weird darkness to it. That's probably how I would naturally or instinctively try to write the song a little bit darker a little bit more menacing and really it's not it's like a nice like little love duet almost like the right. sweet sweeping like beautiful music underneath it that kind of like oh this is not what i was expecting to happen when the judge and, and sweeney met for the first time you know i think that, that i love this question <laughs> now yeah i think this also parallels really well then with epiphany it's like yeah. um, this is very opposite and eccentric um sort of way we are thinking of sweeney and what he's trying to get out of the people he's interacting with and coming across i love the question of you know what what do we expect out of the first meeting and the tone that we expect out of these two people meeting for the first yeah. time in theory yeah, you almost think like epiphany would be this song in a way like i, I know mm -hmm. why it's not like there's other narrative reasons why the epiphany has to come after something like this but just like yeah if you were just to ask someone blind like well this is the storyline this is what's going to happen what would you imagine that song sounding like it would be more like epiphany i think but i think you know the intent for sweeney in singing what he sings is to gain the trust of turpin Mm -hmm. That's how I've always sort of understood the song to function. Um, and so he's singing this very sweet love ballad, maybe, uh, mm -hmm. to sort of get into Turpin's social bubble, I suppose, yeah, yeah. Um, because of the fact that the kill is not happening right at this very moment. Mm -hmm. um, I think, too, like you, you've already kind of mentioned this. For me, there are these three songs in Act One that are kind of inextricably linked together, which is we have Wait that came a little bit earlier. 
We have pretty women here now and an epiphany that follows right after it. Wade is all about, hey, I know you want to enact your revenge, but if we wait this out, it's going to eventually come. Although, as we discussed in that song, if people will remember, is like Mrs. Lovett has two reasons to do that. One, yeah, she does want to wait this out, but also she doesn't really care if he ever kills the judge. That's not what her motivations are. Mm-hmm. But regardless, that sets up Sweeney. Like, okay, yes, I accept that. We should wait this out. Revenge will be better if I let this kind of naturally come to me and I can do it. Then we have Pretty Women, which gets interrupted by Anthony. Spoiler alert for the end of this song, <laughs> which then leads right into Epiphany to be like, okay, fine. If I can't kill who I wanted to kill, Everyone deserves to die, and I'm just going to start killing everyone that I see. And each of those kind of leads into one another. That's a long-winded way of saying. (laughs) Are are there anything that you can see that, I guess, that bridges these songs together? Sort of just building on what Mm. you've already mapped out of of the trio of songs. I think Pretty Women troubles the idea of waiting, right? Because of the um, interruption of Mm -hmm. Anthony at the end. Because I think the first couple phrases... That Sweeney has an epiphany is I had him. I had him yes. like he was right here. I think that is very much in line with the characterization that's happening in epiphany. Like he's finally come to this epiphany and realization mm-hmm. that this is what he wants to do. And I think without pretty women, he would not get to that point. He would not have this larger motivation of well, killing everybody and that everybody mm-hmm. deserves to die. That was actually something I was thinking of just you know, what would be lost if pretty women were taken out? And and I think that's part of the answer I would have. Yeah, I mean, Sondheim kind of breaks this down a little bit in his book, Finishing the Hat. Mm. Of all of them, I think if you did a cursory glance, most people would say, you could probably cut weight out of this score, right? It's it's literally a sign that's like, hey, just wait around. You could just do that in a bit of dialogue and, and, and get on with the show. But it is interesting that even in the movie where they cut other, other things, they don't cut weight because Sondheim was very adamant. No, you need mm. to have that song. At first listen, it feels like you're wasting time. But when you get further into the show, you realize how important that song was for everything that follows it. And if you were trying to do a hack and slash and make this into like, we need to have Sweeney Todd be a one act show, right? We have to cut this right down. The three songs I think you absolutely could not cut are Wait, Pretty Women and Epiphany. Like you need those three songs to be here for everything to really work. First in the first act and then, of course, in the second act where it sets everything up as well. If we're going to start ranking songs by what I think their importance are in the show. (laughs) Oh, that's one of my favorite questions to ask students is to defend choices right. that you might make in, in cutting or adding songs. Yeah. The other song, of course, is the full version of parlor songs. You need the full version of parlor songs. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everyone, just Kyle breaking into the conversation here to tell you about some of the people and organizations that help this show continue to go. I always like to start this off by telling you that if you'd like to help support the show for absolutely free, you can give a rating and review on whatever app you listen to podcasts in. And if you'd like to help monetarily, which will only help to grow and make this show better, you can do so over at our Patreon page. Please do not donate if it impacts you negatively financially. I also should give a huge thank you to the God That's Good tier from Patreon. That's Jack Tom. Todd, Carrie, Luis, Christopher, and Stephen. Putting Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. We actually have a new sponsor this week. We are brought to you by Northwest Fest. Northwest Fest International Documentary Festival, in fact, running in cinemas from May 6th to the 14th and online from May 5th to the 15th. Northwest Fest is thrilled to finally be able to bring the festival back to Metro Cinema this year with an outstanding lineup of some of the year's best documentaries and a few fun surprises. This year's festival is a hybrid affair with over 20 films screening at Metro Cinema, including the acclaimed Nick Cave music documentary, This Much I Know to be True along with dozens of features and short films screening online. Award-winning filmmaker Alexandre O. Philippe will also be in town to present his filmmaking masterclass. This event will be open to the public and is an absolute must for anyone who's ever dreamed of making their own film. Check out the full Northwest Fest film lineup and purchase all access passes or single tickets at northwestfest.ca. 
This week, we're also brought to you by Pod Power. With Pod Power, our sponsors are making it possible for us to amplify the voices of Albertans and Alberta podcasters. This episode, Edmonton Community Foundation is helping us give a Pod Power shout out to What's the Cheesemus? What's the Cheesemus is a new podcast with an inside look on Philippine X identity in the diaspora. Cheesemus is a Tagalog word for gossip. Subscribe to hear weekly episodes about disappointing your parents, breaking it to your friends that you're not Italian trying to figure out who punched your car, and much, much more. What's the Cheesemus is produced by CJSR, Edmonton's campus and community radio station. Download it wherever you find podcasts and on whatsthecheesemus.transistor.fm. And Cheesemus, I should point out, is spelled T-S-I-S-M-I-S. I guess we should start going through these lyrics here then. So the song starts off by Judge Turpin, of course, singing, You see, sir, a man infatuate with love, her ardent and eager slave. So fetch the pomade and pumice stone and lend me a more seductive tone, a sprinkling, perhaps, of French cologne. But first, sir, I think, a shave. And then Todd says, the closest I ever gave, kind of muttering under his breath. You see, sir, a man infatuate with love, her ardent and eager slave. So fetch the pomade and palm a stone and lend me a more seductive tone, a sprinkling, perhaps, of French cologne. But first, sir, I think a shame. The closest I ever gave. talking about echoes throughout the score here again this of course is just referring back to what the beetle was singing moments ago in ladies and their sensitivities it's the same melody to ask i guess like a, a character motivation why why use that same melody why give that to the judge to start off this song for me it's almost like the judge being convinced by beetles exposure that turpin has mm-hmm. this lack of confidence in uh, well, I guess two things, lack of confidence, but also this false suggestion that, you know, if you only looked a little bit better, that Joanna would fall in love with you immediately. I do think it's really interesting that uh, he's borrowing the musical phrases um, that have been sung to him. And so I think that's why I, I think it's him taking on the suggestions of of the Beatle, because otherwise in Ladies and Their Sensitivities, he has no musical lines. Um, it's actually all uh, Beatles singing. And I think that it really does show like his head is still kind of in that conversation here a little bit. The the one big thing when the Beatles sings it, this is why I just love talking about Sondheim so much because even with the same melody, he's able to use character so well mm-hmm. with it because mm-hmm. the Beatle, even using the same uh, musical phrasing, literally says my lord at the end of every line. Like That's the rhyme with the word before it. And here, of course, the judge is not going to say Lord <laughs> to, to Sweeney. So he actually does have a bit more of a rhyme scheme that goes through the entire thing with uh, with it stone, tone, cologne, mm. and then slave rhymes with shave further on down there. So that's where the headspace of Judge Turpin is. This is kind of how we, and this is how we kind of move into the song here. So the judge is sitting down. We're tying like the little bib around the judge here at this point. And Todd sings, "'Tis your delights are catching fire from one man to the next." And then the judge says, "'Tis true, sir, love can still inspire the blood to pound a heart leap higher." And they both come together saying, "'What more, what more can man require than love, sir? More than love, sir. What, sir? Women. Ah, yes, women. Pretty women." "'Tis your delight, sir, catching fire from one man to the next." "'Tis true, sir, love can still inspire the blood to pound a heart leap higher. What more, what more can, can man require, require than love, sir?" One thing I wanted to point out, I'm really intrigued by Sweeney's, sorry, we're going back a little bit more, Sweeney's (laughs) The Closest I Ever Gave being the same exact notes and rhythm of of Turpin. Yes. I, I think even if Turpin is not necessarily hearing Sweeney in that moment it is also uh, the song is also giving us a very early idea of what Sweeney is is thinking and and expecting you actually skipped this in your 
explanation right now, but I'm very intrigued by the bum bum and whistling. Oh yeah, let's talk about that. Yeah, let's talk let's talk about the whistling and stuff like that because that happens um a little bit in ladies and their sensitivities as well, like the vocalizations a bit. But yeah, they do a lot. They do a lot in this song. I bring this back to my reading of the song as Sweeney trying to gain Turpin's trust because this musical the musical repeating even if he's not necessarily bum bumming, he's whistling the mm-hmm. same tune, though. He's whistling in sync and in unison with him. That to me is a very uh, suggest- suggestive of what Sweeney is trying to convey to um, yes. Judge Turpin in the moment. He's trying to be friendly with them. He's trying to, um, well, Judge Turpin thinks that he's being merry and that he's just in a merry mood. And, and uh, Sweeney plays it off as being just inspired by Turpin's love and, right, and joy right. in that moment. Um, but well, it's also too, I wonder, I hadn't thought about this until we, we just brought it up here, but going back to that idea of weight, right? At least for me, whistling kind of connotes something like, you know, I'm walking down the street without a care in the world. Or it's like, I'm yeah. not like heavily trying to do something. I'm like, kind of like taking my time. I'm whistling a tune. And so I think that that is going back into this idea. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm allowing this to happen. He's going to sit down. I'm going to win back my revenge. I don't have to hurry this along. Uh, yeah. So overall there to, to bring in the next section as well, there's a lot of Sweeney here feigning a sort of almost like a brotherly mm-hmm. friendship um, forming. I think I I think this a lot about the songs in Sweeney Todd that there's this constant double meaning happening um, that sure. one person is thinking or singing one thing and another person is thinking and singing another thing. Love it and Sweeney um, duets especially uh, something like No Place Like London or this song too. It's it's like Sweeney is or earlier he tries to play off a sort of reverence to the judge. He knows who he is. I think. That is more in the movie because he says he's so honored to have him in the shop. And Judge yes. Turpin is kind of like, how do you know who I am? Um, and so <laughs> even there, it starts as a, oh, well, of course I know who you are. And please come and sit down and um, let me take care of you. Yeah. And we, and we can tell through other songs, other parts in the show, like the judge loves compliments, right? Like he wants to feel like he's the most important person in the room. Uh, which is also very much in line with why he's there um, mm-hmm. and, and why his first uh musical phrases are repeating the beatles suggestions that if he only looked a little bit more attractive and a little bit more clean um, mm-hmm. that he would be able to uh, conquer joanna as you mentioned sweeney todd is kind of building them up right like well your obvious um love is emanating from you like it's capturing my my spirit here that's like your delight sir is catching fire from one man to the next like it's just uh, coming off of you and i'm and i'm receiving it but then there's like well what more can man require than this love that that you judge that, that you judge are experiencing and it's todd it's sweeney todd who says well you need women specifically pretty women <laughs> that is what's more than love so i guess my question really here in this section is is what do they mean by love are they talking mm. romantic love familiar love is it this the general catch-all term because i think it's an interesting pivot that, that sweeney todd is going in this song that he is the one that brings up you need women more than you need love in your life that's a great point i hadn't even thought about that that sweeney mm-hmm. is the one that makes the suggestion first the show as a whole for me is really all about all types of love and so going back to the double meaning of this song Sweeney's love here is much more of a familial, but also like a reminiscent love of what he remembers of like seeing his wife and his daughter. That That's how it comes off to me. Um, whereas mm-hmm. Judge Turpin's love is very much like a lust and, and a sexual love. I think um, later lines, his words are also very much rooted in like the physical aspects of yes. women, whereas Sweeney's are much more like action. Um, mm-hmm. they're weather watching or like flower picking and yeah, yeah. <laughs> all this stuff. It, it kind of just keeps adding into that fact that Sweeney seems to be setting this trap, right? I, for, my little fan fiction, I guess that I'm really writing here <laughs> is it's not so much that he wants to enact revenge. I really do think he wants the judge to confess in the chair as well. That's mm. not as, it's not so much as like, oh, I get to slice his throat. It's also, I sent you away for no good reason. I killed your wife and I'm going to marry your daughter. Like he wants those words. And so I think he's just feeding them these lines like, oh, that's right. Like pretty women have been in my life. And like, 
this reminds me of this thing and et cetera, et cetera. Like it feels like Sweeney is just feeding him these lines for him to go into the confession. I've never thought about it that way, but now that you say mm-hmm. that, I'm thinking about the I think there's two slips that occur in the song where Sweeney uh says pretty as pretty as her yep. mother or pretty as her mother, else. Yeah. And he like almost gets caught and and now that what you're saying sort of makes sense to you why those moments also occur in the song that that he's trying to sort of push Judge Turpin to say something more. That's right. <laughs> and, and reveal something. Yeah. The song has always felt a little bit like that, if you, especially if you see it performed, because Sweeney does feel like he's putting on a different character when the judge comes in. Yes, he's being more happy. He's whistling. He's doing all this stuff. Mm-hmm. But it also feels like he is portraying a role rather than being the Sweeney Todd we've kind of seen up until that point. So it's kind of interesting that way. This next part, though, is another reprise. We're going back to My Friends, where Sweeney has actually... Uh, lathered up the judge's face and he takes out his razor and now he sings now then my friend now to your purpose patience enjoy it revenge can't be taken in haste and then the judge interrupts and says make haste and if we wed you'll be commended sir and sweeney says my lord and who may it be said is your intended sir my ward and pretty as a rosebud and then todd says pretty as her mother what what was that oh Nothing, sir, nothing. May we proceed. Now then, my friend, now to your purpose. Patience, enjoy it. Revenge can't be taken in Make haste, and if we wed, you'll be commended, sir. My lord. And who may it be said is your intended, sir, my ward. And pretty as a rose, but pretty as her mother. What? What was that? Oh, nothing, sir, nothing, nothing. May we proceed? Pretty women. Something I was thinking about is how this song, because it starts with the two echoes of previous songs and previous songs that almost feel like, well, my friends, I didn't get a chance to listen to the full podcast episode you did on yeah. on this, but uh, it seems to me like sort of like an I want song. I don't know if yeah. you talked about it in that way. Um, yeah. Ladies and their sensitivities, even though it's Beatles song, actually, um, it feels like it is propelling the judge to th- think about what he wants uh so it's this song here in pretty women it feels like it is framed as a sort of combo secondary i want song for the two men Mm. i was also thinking about you know what happens when you're bringing these two i almost thought two very different men together but are they that different in this moment is also a question i was wondering um is the point of the song to show how similar they are how different they are what are we meant to parallel between the two men in this context yeah i think i think it's a an appropriate question and it's something that i kind of keep coming back to with different uh musical phrases that happen in this song word choices that are shared between it but there is kind of this subtext that runs through this show not so much that they are quote unquote like the same but occasionally can have motivations that are similar Mm. which is the judge sweeney and anthony kind of the three males (laughs) that are inside this show and of course like Anthony is like the very naive young man inside this show, but also does have elements of like, oh, there seems to be this sort of darkness that's there with him at times, um, or at least compared, like he always says he wants to steal uh, mm-hmm. Joanna. He uses that word over and over again. He's in the shadows, like he's, he he uses that terminology. The judge thinking that he is, he, I think, kind of fooled himself into believing he's a better man than what he is. He's justified himself. Mm-hmm. And then Sweeney being like, I am righteous indignation and I'm going to take my vengeance. And I think all of them ha- could take a step back and like, is it though? Like, are you <laughs> as righteous as you think you actually are? Definitely there's a sliding scale for, for all of that. But but definitely in this song, I think you, you've you hit on something that's, I think, really fascinating. Just thinking of an audience member, I do think that we want Sweeney to succeed in his revenge at least at this point like we feel like we are justified in seeing him killing another man within the fiction of this show and then as yet we have you have to take a step back like well but do we 
agree with like just going and killing people mm-hmm. <laughs> anyone that wrongs you like we do have to have both of those things in uh, at the same time yes the judge is kind of like morally corrupt and stuff but at the same time do we just go kill anyone that we want to kill i also just think it's nice having to duet between these two people but the third character in this is the razors <laughs> so he's bringing yeah, was, my friends like he's, well. he's singing it and he now has the razor which has had a very specific moment as it glistens in like the spotlight and in the song my friends so he's now bringing them back out so we again are like okay here's the moment we're getting there we're gonna see him finally kill this is where the blood starts to flow sort of thing i was wondering um because he keeps referring to the razors as my friend is the is the act of murder then essentially not his like he's Mm. not the one doing it then he's displacing it onto the razors themselves yeah that's something that we didn't bring up like with a very fine point i think you're right i think that there is this interesting like justification by saying like oh well the razors are the ones that are committing the murder i'm not committing the murder in a way like using that my friend's terminology like it's a person you're personifying it Mm -hmm. um anthropomorphizing it however you want to label that uh inside of that that episode uh, on my friends we my guest was tom sesma who has played sweeney todd yeah, before tom. yeah and so he yeah, oh yeah i got to see him as, as sweeney yeah okay you saw I, I was gonna say he was in that version too he made the comment like how he portrayed the role not that it is the correct way but at least for him he felt that he played the role of benjamin barker for the majority of the show uh, until you switch oh. to Sweeney Todd later on, and that's okay. how you, how he like hides himself. So yeah, I think there was a very distinct difference between Benjamin Barker, Sweeney Todd, and then the My Friends are kind of like what lets him, you know, be the murderous person that he wants to be. It's like his mask, basically. Yeah, I'm I'm also looking at the lyrics because it's like now to your purpose or yeah. um that whole idea of patience and that revenge can't be taken in haste he's like displacing these ideas and and suggestions onto the razors i do think there's a lot of character work that's being done here they continue on this is when kind of i do it does start to happen and moments where they'll sing over top of each other but todd but todd starts off by saying pretty women fascinating sipping coffee dancing pretty women are wonder Pretty women sitting in the window or standing on the stair. Something in them cheers the air. Pretty women silhouetted stay within you, glancing, stay forever, breathing lightly. Pretty women, and then they both come together. Pretty women blowing out their candles or combing out their hair. And the judge is singing, then they leave. Even when they leave you and vanish, they somehow can still remain there with you they're with you and todd is singing even when they leave they still are there they're there pretty women fascinating sipping coffee dancing pretty women are a wonder pretty women sitting in the window Standing on the stair Something in them Cheers the air Ah, pretty women Silhouetted Stay within you Glancing Stay forever Breathing lightly Pretty women Pretty women blowing out their candles or combing out their hair. Even when they leave, they still are there. They're there. Pretty women at their mirrors. Number one, I think it is absolutely fascinating that. Uh, ju- the judge is not actually creating any of his own melodies still mm. in this moment, right? Because um, the the ladies and their sensitivities tune was something that he borrowed. And then even here, he listens to a verse from Sweeney, essentially, yep. and then he sort of echoes it back to him. Um, so there's that. Yes. Um, I don't know what that means exactly, but I thought it was an, it was an no, interesting no, observation. That is true. I like that. 
I, of course, am always fascinated just knowing Sondheim and delving into so much of his work. He would not give specific lines to specific characters without a specific purpose. <laughs> so, uh, you know, for some lyric writers, maybe I could say, yeah, they just needed someone to sing this line. Great. We can move on. But I don't think it's true in this case. And I do think that it kind of hides kind of both sometimes double meanings and character motivations and stuff here, too. Sweeney says pretty women. And he says that they're fascinating, sipping coffee, dancing or sitting in the window, standing on the stair. So those are like the actions he's talking about. I have my own feelings about this. But for you, do you think he's talking about someone in particular? Like, is he thinking about a particular pretty woman or is he just saying general things about pretty women? I've always thought it to be that he's singing about um, his wife and daughter. Yes. Like it is a reminiscent of what he remembers of them, what he noticed of them. Again, just sort of these mundane sort of actions of sipping coffee. But he, mm -hmm. it, in those moments, um, he remembers how uh, much love he felt for them or or uh, how much they were pretty or beautiful in that moment. Um, it, 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 this song also makes me feel like it's very... It's almost like a voyeuristic uh, mm -hmm. type of song. Like the two men are describing their observations of what pretty women do. Yeah, they were looking at these women. But I think you're right. Like that's how I have always read it as well. Like, that Sweeney specifically is thinking about wife and daughter. The judge is obviously thinking about Joanna specifically. Like so, mm -hmm. there's a kind of a a Venn diagram going on here about like they yes. are kind of talking about the same person. But it again is interesting which words go to which person. Mm -hmm. So I think that they, it is fairly banal what Sweeney is talking about in that like yeah they enact your own stories here. But you know he was sipping coffee with his wife in the morning. They went dancing. Him his wife or his daughter were standing uh, in the or sitting in the window, standing on the stairs when he got home. Whatever it happens to be. The judge specifically says in this section that they're silhouetted, glancing, breathing lightly um, before they come together here in a second, which in the original production, because they cut out the judge's version of Joanna, of course, oh, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have known that necessarily. In more recent productions, they put it back in. So there's definitely a bigger, <laughs> yeah. I think, tying together of these concepts. But like that is how he has seen Joanna through the keyhole, silhouetted from from the window, her breathing lightly her um that he is glancing at her <laughs> through, through this thing so it is a bit more it, it is a little more lecherous from his point of view mm -hmm. it is voyeuristic then in this case and that's what the interesting part about this song is i've always felt about this song is that it goes back and forth really quickly about like oh there's a deep love the the, the banality of love of like just like spending your days with someone paired with someone who is much more like overtly leering at pretty women and they're going back and forth <laughs> with each other. So it's like this really weird push and pull from this song. Because Joanna's at least typically cut, um, right. the sort of sexually tormented version of Turpin, I think, is uh, lost mm -hmm. in Pretty Women now. But even so, yeah, just the silhouetted glancing, breathing lightly, the three very brief descriptions he gives are still physically rooted they're sexually rooted i think you they can feel weird yeah get a glance of that when i was listening to the uh, uh, original broadway soundtrack of course they do have the judge's version of joanna on there so maybe it made me remember that a little bit but that's always what it's felt like it's like oh this feels gross when, when, when the judge yeah. sings about his his stuff i think the more fascinating part about this or the most fascinating part is when they both come together to s sing the same thing Although in most cases, the judge is slightly trailing Sweeney Todd mm -hmm. in this. So again, you can kind of read this in a couple of different ways. Like is Sweeney actually saying this and the judge is agreeing with it? Or are they actually both with the same idea mm. at the same time? Uh, Sondheim has been very critical of characters saying the same thing at the same time <laughs> with each oh. other, unless in very specific cases. So this okay. is one of those specific cases where they are singing the same thing at the same time. But how do you read then? specifically the blowing out their candles or combing out their hair i think you brought up in the outline the flower picking yeah lyric and now i'm thinking about the blowing <laughs> lyric as just being <laughs> yeah, this yeah. like sexual suggestion going back to the fact that the judge is echoing sweeney's verse uh or musical verse earlier i think it makes sense here that he's again sort of what you're saying trailing behind Sweeney mm -hmm. that he's huh 
yeah, the question of whether he's actually in agreement with with uh, Sweeney is interesting. But f- for a lot of the songs, I think that characters like uh, the judge here and then like Mrs. Lovett in other cases, they're like off in their own worlds. They're like hearing these mm-hmm. things and then they sort of echo back or sing back these phrases and they're like um, fantasizing in these other worlds um, that they have. Um, and so for Turpin in this case, he's he's very much like, it, it seems like he's fantasizing, of course, about um, mm-hmm. Joanna and, and what he imagines her to do. Or And he's maybe not so much in this particular moment or in this song, but he's um, gaining excitement from from imagining um, this image of her. Yeah, that's a, that's the weird thing about it. It's like both saying the same thing, but I think have vastly different intentions behind how, what they are yes. talking about in these lyrics, Absolutely. which is fascinating to to pull apart here's how the song ends though they sing together ah pretty women and then they go back and forth again by saying at their mirrors in their gardens letter writing flower picking weather watching how they make a man sing proof of heaven as you're living pretty women sir pretty women yes pretty women sir pretty women pretty women sir ah, pretty women at their mirrors Let's a rising flower picking Where they're watching how they make a man sing Proof of heaven as you're living Pretty women, sir, pretty women Yes, pretty women, sir, all women and then, of course, Anthony walks in like a dolt that he is and <laughs> interrupts the whole thing. Yeah, so this is a I would imagine this is the build up to, uh, to Sweeney actually about to commit the act. That's how I'm reading the um, mm-hmm. build up of the musicality and the final sort of idea that like how women make a man sing there. It's almost like putting women on a pedestal uh, pedestal yeah. on at this very moment um, and what that means for each of the characters. Again, yeah, that Sweeney has this hidden intention mm-hmm. um, behind why he's singing about pretty women and, and what women mean to him um, in his life. And so there's this build up to constant repetition of pretty women. Yeah, um, yeah. And yeah, I'm just thinking about what the that specific phrase means to the two different men and what they're thinking in this very moment. Because yeah, yeah, like, Sweeney for me is thinking like, OK, it's going to happen. <laughs> I'm going to kill him. Well, right I, yeah, I, I think it ties back to that love por- portion, right? I do think that Sweeney Todd truly loves his wife, loves his daughter. And then that is aided by how he terms pretty women, right? The prettiness of his wife, the prettiness of his daughter. I do not believe Judge Turpin loves Joanna, at least not mm-hmm. in that way. I think he is lustful after Joanna. I think he wants her sexually. Uh, and he looks at her as a pretty woman. But I think it's two separate things that they're talking about here in this case. I think that's hit home too. Like Judge Turpin has already said that she's as pretty as a rosebud. And while yes, like again, we're talking about these banal things. They're singing back and forth with like letter writing in their gardens, weather watching. I don't think it's a mistake that they give Judge Turpin the flower picking line where, you know, that can be used as the analogy of like plucking virginity that that, Mm -hmm. that has been happening in the classic literature for centuries. Yeah, I just think Sondheim is very specific with how he's (laughs) or or these phrases of what the men are singing about. And while pretty women are important for both of them, I think the way they want to honor pretty women are different is how I would argue it. Even though I guess musically it makes sense that they are repeating the uh, title phrase, I think it's a point should be made that Judge Turpin is limited in his language about sure. women in this moment. Um, limited in that he doesn't have that many phrases anyway, and also right. that he keeps echoing Sweeney's words, but also that this constant repetition of pretty women at the end, it's like he doesn't know how else to articulate. Yeah, um, yeah. They are just these uh, objects to him that leads me to the second thing of of how women are treated in the show um sure. how, and how joanna is treated in the show in particular um because for both anthony and judge turpin they're she's very much an object um mm-hmm. you were mentioning yeah the the steel phrase that anthony always repeats and here it's it's very much like joanna is just a almost like commodity for them that she's something to be, I don't know, traded and swapped and owned. It, it's true. I think that is one of the other things that kind of pairs up like the judge and Anthony. Like, I, I do think Anthony is 
a little bit more altruistic about it, but he is still kind of looking at Joanna as an object to go after, which which isn't great. The the more fascinating thing I have discovered doing this season, and the audience is going to be probably sick and tired of me bringing this up every time, but I do like the idea that some productions I've seen, or at least some clips that I've seen, that uh, the creators give Joanna a little bit more agency within the show. I actually think the movie does a great job of this, of giving her a little bit more to do, mm. so she's not just the object to be fond over. It's my theory that she's just using Anthony as a way to get out of this, and she's going to leave him at oh. the next port. <laughs> that, mm. that she she just sees a way out of, of her bad situation sort of thing. But yeah, again, I'll save that for my sequel novel that I'll work on here later on. <laughs> yeah, also the the song is is very much putting women in a passive yeah. role. It, again, it's that kind of generalized too of like pretty women. <laughs> but the, uh, I think the the biggest thing is like both both of these guys are just like talking about them looking at these pretty women. Like yeah. the pretty women in themselves aren't doing anything or not mm-hmm. like with them or like they're not going on a I don't want to say journey, but like it really is just them looking at them doing tasks or things rather than being like, hey, this is a relationship we're in. Mm-hmm. So I think it's it's uh, tips off both of their their hands a little bit here. Well, Sammy, thank you so much for joining me here today. This has been really great. The I guess the, the last few questions I like to ask, like for you, at least for pretty women, if you were to rank the songs of Sweeney Todd, do you feel this would show up in like your top five, middle five, bottom five, like where would it kind of rank for you, do you think? <laughs> Are you talking musically? Are you talking thematically? You can take that however you want, but uh, yeah, however you want to, to frame hmm. that. I don't know musically if it would be top five, but I'm biased in the sense that it would be in my top five thematically, um, mm-hmm. just because this is a favorite of mine to talk about with students as well um just because i feel like i don't know i feel like people may dismiss it um initially just because it's not it it may not seem as important as the other duets at least or as the other character building um songs but um just with everything that we've been talking about there is so much revealed about the characters and about their intentions and about sort of what state they're in through the not only through the lyrics but through the musical phrases happening and so that's what makes it so important for me and so i would rank it higher up i have to also say this has my favorite like i don't know book quote you know it's not it's not a sung bit here at least in the original broadway cast i love how the judge when when anthony comes in of course he's yelling at them both is like i can't believe that you're here steal away my daughter you won't but then he's like he turns on me and says, and as for you, Barber, your, your customers, you service them well and hold their custom because you'll have none of mine. And then he slams oh, the door. Yes, yes. I just love that turn of phrase, hold their custom. Yes. If people wanted to stay in contact with you, see what you're up to, is there a way to do so online? Yes. Well, I can't say I look at my Twitter very much, but Twitter, sure. Instagram, I am working on revamping my uh, professional website, but nice. that too. Now, this is the maybe the hardest question that we wrap up uh, every episode oh, no. here this season. Which is, what is your favorite type of pie? Ooh, I want to, I want to say two things here. Great. My favorite pie is apple pie. Great. But. Classic choice. <laughs> I want to say that each time I went to the Barrow Street production, I always had a meat pie because it was uh-huh. so delicious. <laughs> Do you know what they had? Like what kind? It was just like a round beef or something inside of it? I have or? no idea. But if anybody has that recipe... That was a delicious well, you know, pie. This is when I'd be like stuffing them into my bag or something like that when they weren't looking. Or... <laughs> All right. Thanks, Stephanie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to putting it together podcast at gmail.com. And you can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash putting it together podcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network, to Northwest Fest, and to Pod Power this week. Putting it together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we'll be discussing um, 
Oh, gosh, yeah, just a sudden realization. It's Epiphany next week. As always, a big thank you to the great Chris Taniguchi who designed the podcast artwork and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now. <laughs>